The Maximum Entropy Principle. So some important notes, reminder of what uh, log base 2 is with respect to the natural logarithm, because often we'll use the natural logarithm, but when we do so, that means we're measuring information in nats instead of bits. One nat is 1 over log 2 bits, which is about 1.44 bits. Also, self-information, i of x, is often denoted instead as little h of x, and that's in correspondence with entropy, capital H of capital X, being the expected value of self-information, in this case, little h of x. So let's review. Suppose we have a joint probability distribution. Then we get joint surprisal from x being t sub x and y being u sub y in the same trial. It's the negative base 2 logarithm of p of xy in bits or the negative natural log of p of xy in nat. So h of x is the surprisal from x equals t sub x, h of y surprisal from y equals u sub y. If x is independent of y, then the self-information joint is equal to the sum of the individual self-informations. The entropy for a joint distribution is the expected value of the joint surprisal, which is going to be a double sum over x and y of the joint distribution times the base 2 logarithm of p of xy. And of course, it's negative. And it's only over those uh, distribution values which are greater than 0. Probability equals 0 doesn't contribute to entropy. So the entropy of the variable x is the expected value of h of x. The entropy of the variable y is the expected value of h of y. The joint entropy is the expected value of the joint surprisal, which if they're independent, then it's equal to the expected value of the sum, which is the sum of the expected values, which means we have the sum of the entropies. In other words, if x is independent of y, then the joint entropy is the sum of the individual entropies. So entropy can be thought of as a function on probability distributions. Let me explain. Here's Shannon entropy, and we can think of it as a function of variables p1 to pr with the constraints that the p's are non-negative and summed to 1. For example, a binary classifier would have a p1 and a p2, the entropy would be h of p1 and p2, which is negative p1 log base 2 p1 minus p2 log base 2 p2. The constraint p1 plus two, p2 equals 1 means that p2 is 1 minus p1. Just relabel the p1 by just p. And then our entropy, h of p is negative p log base 2 of p minus 1 minus p log base 2 of 1 minus p. That is, entropy is actually a function of r minus 1 variables because we can eliminate one using the fact that they sum to 1. Notice that self-information is non-negative, so entropy is non-negative. And what if we had p sub i as 1 for some i, which would have to force all the other p's to be 0? Well, then our entropy would be 0. And as p sub i decreases from 1, the surprisal increases. So entropy is a measure of disorder. If an event always occurs, its entropy is zero. But if that event becomes more uncertain, its entropy is positive and increases with the event's uncertainty. Well, that's intuitively. But we can only go so far with intuition. Let's look at the math. The math is convexity. Now, remember that a set uh, C, a subset of Rn, is convex if two points P, Q, and C implies that the line segment between them, 1 minus alpha P plus alpha Q, is also in C, where alpha is in 0, 1. A function is convex if its epigraph is convex, and its epigraph is a set of points in Rn plus 1 for which the function f of x is less than or equal to y. That is, f is convex if its graph and the region above it form a set that contains all the line segments between its points. In other words, 
if the epigraph is convex, if you've got two points PQ, then the line segment between them is also in there, where this 1 minus alpha P plus alpha Q is just the uh, notation for all the points on the line segment between P and Q. Alpha equals 0 is P, alpha equals 1 is Q. So if I let x alpha be 1 minus alpha x naught plus alpha x1 for x naught and x1 in C, in C. Uh, and y alpha be 1 minus alpha f of x naught plus alpha f of x1, then it's a nice little exercise to show that the point x alpha comma y alpha is in the epigraph. Here's a hint on how to do so. And since f of x alpha is less than or equal to y alpha, if f is convex, then we have this new definition for what it means for a function to be convex. So a function f from Rn to R is convex if, given two points in Rn and alpha in the interval 0, 1, f of the linear combination 1 minus alpha x1 plus alpha x2 is less than or equal to 1 minus alpha times f of x1 plus alpha f of x2. And the converse is also true. If we have f of 1 minus alpha x1 plus alpha x2 less than or equal to 1 minus alpha that quantity times f of x1 plus alpha f of x2, then by the uh, a proof that's identical to the exercise at the bottom of the previous slide, That'll show that the epigraph of f is convex. So if we've got p1 is 1 minus alpha and p2 is alpha, then p1 and p2 are not negative and they sum to 1. In other words, there are a probability distribution on s with these two uh, vectors, and f of p1 x1 plus p2 x2 is less than or equal to p1 f of x1 plus p2 f of x2. Suppose we had three probabilities uh, in our probability distribution on three points. Then the function of this expected value, p1 x1 plus p2 x2 plus p3 x3, we're going to look at it only when p3 is not 1, because if p3 is equal to 1, p1 and p2 are 0, and it's not, uh, nothing really to talk about. And given that, I can write f of the quantity 1 minus p3 times, and notice I factored out now 1 minus p3 from the first two, so I've got p1 over 1 minus p3 x1 plus p2 over 1 minus p3 x2 plus, uh, after all that, our p3 x3, all that inside our function. But by convexity, that means that we have 1 minus p3 f of this linear combination of x1 and x2 plus p3 f of x3. But p1 over 1 plus p3 plus p2 over 1 plus uh, minus p3 uh, is a probability distribution. When you add them together, you get p1 plus p2 over 1 minus p3, but p1 plus p2 plus p3 is 1, so p1 plus p2 is 1 minus p3. In other words, we all that sums to 1. So using our uh, previous uh, result, uh, we get the p1 over 1 minus p3 f of x1 plus p2 over 1 minus p3 f of x2, that entire quantity, times 1 minus p3 plus the p3 f of x3. And we get cancellation, and we have the expected value of the function values. So this is actually a theorem. A function f from r into r is convex if and only if f of this expected value of the x's is less than or equal to the expected value of the function values of the x's. For all probability distributions on uh, r points in rn. The proof is by induction. Assume it's true up to r minus 1 that pr is not 1. pr is equal to 1. All the other p's are 0. There's nothing to prove. Let qi be pi over 1 minus pr. Then the qi's form a probability distribution. And we have 
by, uh, we're assuming now, convexity and trying to prove this inequality. And so we have uh, f convex means that we get uh, f of the entire uh, argument is less than or equal to 1 minus pr times f of q1 x1 up to qr minus 1 xr minus 1 uh, plus uh, pr f of xr. But the q1 to qr is form a probability distribution, so by our induction hypothesis, we also have to have this step. But q1 is p1 over 1 minus pr up to qr minus 1 is uh, pr minus 1 over 1 minus pr. So that means we get cancellation of all these 1 minus prs, and there we have it. Convex implies that f of this expected value is less than or equal to the expected value of the f's. In other words, in summation notation, we get exactly this for that inequality, f of the sum, which is an expected value of p sub i, x sub i, is less than or equal to the expected value of the function values. And if we let r be 2 and assume that we have this uh, summation notation holds and just use it for r equals 2, we can go back to the previous slide and we get the epigraph of f as convex. So our theorem is proven if and only if. So convexity, uh, this is our definition in summation notation, or actually a theorem, uh, that we just looked at. And we call p1 x1 up to pr xr, it is an expected value, but we call it a convex linear combination. And if negative of a uh, function is convex, then we define that function to be concave. And there's a nice theorem. If uh, you have a whole bunch of f's that are convex from r into r, uh, then any convex combination of those f's is also convex. And the proof is a good exercise, like uh, on a midterm or final. So what about just ordinary functions of one variable? Well, convex means curving up with respect to the horizontal. And concave means curving down with respect to the horizontal. So if we only have two uh, labels, then convex means f of the quantity p1 x1 plus p2 x2 is less than or equal to p1 f of x1 plus p2 f of x2. So let's look at a diagram. This line is a secant line, and it plays an important role because if we have a convex combination, it's between x1 and x2, the function value is less than or equal to the convex combination of the function values. That's the definition of convexity. Also, if f is differentiable, then the graph of f of x is above each of its tangent lines. So, if f is continuous and convex on AB, then it actually has a unique minimum. So, min here stands for minimum. We can see the minimum here is at A, and A is called the argmin of f. So, here we also have a, a minimum, but it's at some C, uh, which is the argmin of f. And notice that the gradient of f at C is equal to zero. And the gradient's what we usually call the derivative. So here's another example of a minimum, but in this case, the arc min is an entire interval. And here, the arc min is also an entire interval. So there are theorems and proofs, which you could learn in a course on convex optimization. Uh, we're not going to look at them here, except for one very important theorem we look at next. If the second derivative is positive and continuous on a interval of R, and f is convex on that interval. The proof uses Taylor's theorem, which says there is some c in that interval, such that f of u equals f of v e plus f prime of v e u minus v plus one half f double prime of c u minus v squared. But that f double prime of c is positive, so we have a non-negative 
final term, which means that f of u must be greater than or equal to the sum of the first two. Let v be equal to a convex combination of x sub i's, where uh, x sub i's are a subset of a, b. v, therefore, is in 8b. And notice that we can rewrite our Taylor's theorem result and then form convex combinations. We can factor out an f of v, but then we've got an i equals 1 to r of p sub i, and that adds up to 1. So that's just f of v plus f prime of v, and we split up the difference in the final sum, and now we have i equals 1 to r p sub i x sub i, and so we get f of v, but v is equal to i equals 1 to r p sub i x sub i. So f of v plus f prime of v. And the sum i equals 1 to r of p sub i sums to 1. So that's minus f prime of v times v, or just f of v. So we've shown this convex combination of f of x sub i's is greater than or equal to f of v, but v is itself a convex combination. And therefore, we have our theorem. So h of x turns out to be concave, which means its negative is convex. Why? Well, if we look at the function negative p log base p of p for b greater than 1, our surprisal function. Remember, this is how we define arbitrary logarithms. The second derivative is less than 0. Therefore, the negative second derivative is greater than zero, and therefore the negative function is convex. We had a theorem. If you have a convex combination of convex functions, you, the result is convex. And notice that entropy is the negative of a convex combination of convex functions. And therefore, if negative of entropy is convex, then entropy itself is concave. And concavity means that we have a maximum that's unique if a maximum exists. So Occam's razor says use the simplest model that sufficiently explains the data. There are infinitely many models. Uh, most are very highly complex. And very highly complex models are inaccessible, they're unknowable. So models learned from data that predict probabilities should select a best probability distribution. And Occam's razor says the best model maximizes the uncertainty not represented in the model. That gives us what's called the maximum entropy principle. The best model is the one that allows the most uncertainty from the data. So a probability distribution should assign an unbiased non-zero probability to every event not excluded by the given information information is going to drive our models. Intuitively, we're saying that anything we can't explain with the data is allowed to have as much uncertainty as possible. So let's look at, for example, at two outcomes, which would have a probability of p or 1 minus p. The entropy is a function of p, and as a function of p, it reaches a maximum when p is equal to a half. Therefore, a, four, a fair coin is the most random or has the maximum entropy uh, process of, with two outcomes. But there are always constraints. Constraints are equations, inequalities, conditions on the variables uh, in the entropy function. For example, the sum of the variables has to be 1. And also, they have to be non-negative, but we won't use those as constraints. We'll just say they define the domain of entropy function. Constraints are often equations of the form g sub j of the variables 0. And that means we often define a brand new function called the Lagrangian, which is the entropy plus uh, new parameters, lambda 1 to lambda c, uh, as a linear combination of the g1 to gc. Or we just substitute from the equations directly into h, and that'll be our preference when we can get away with that. So suppose the process has three outcomes, red, green, and blue. So we'll let P be the probability of red, Q be the probability of green, but notice the probability of blue is 1 minus P minus Q because the three probabilities sum to 1. 
So this is our entropy. So let's notice that as a surface, we can definitely see a maximum, and it occurs at one-third, one-third, which is, if you remember, 1 minus p minus q is the other probability, which is also a third. So if we don't know anything, and there are three possible outcomes, then the least bias, the one that allows the most uncertainty, is a probability of one-third for each of the outcomes. But suppose we know that the probability of green is one-half. In other words, q is equal to a half. If nothing else is known, then we would assume that the least biased, uh, the maximum entropy model, assigns probability of a fourth to the other two outcomes. And this is, in fact, the model we get from the maximum entropy principle, as we'll now see. So suppose it is known that the probability of green is one half. In other words, q is equal to a half. Our entropy, with q equals a half substituted, is given by this, where instead of 1 minus q minus p, we now have a half minus p. The derivative, recall, definition of arbitrary logarithms, and the derivative of log is 1 over p, the natural log. And here's our derivative uh, using the uh, product rule. Notice we can cancel the p's, cancel the 1 half minus p's, we get a minus 1 over log 2 plus 1 over log 2 that cancels and gives us our derivative is negative log base 2 of p plus log base 2 of 1 half minus p. The derivative is 0 when log base 2 of p is equal to log base 2 of 1 half minus p, or when p is equal to 1 half minus p, which is 2p equals a half, which is p equal to a fourth. So maximum entropy model means maximum uncertainty for those parts of the process which are unknown. The entropy, for example, was maximized at p equals a fourth in this example. If it's known that p probability of green is a half, and that's all we know, then the unknown should be as uncertain as possible, which means the probability of red is the probability of blue is a fourth. This has important consequences. Many of our models will be developed using entropy. Entropy can be used to classify patterns. It can even tell us when there are no patterns. Maximum entropy is going to give us our best probability distribution. And we'll obtain best probability distributions via information, not randomness, implying that a probability is probably better thought of as a Bayesian belief or confidence. And in fact, any number between 0 and 1 that we encounter, we're likely going to call it a probability, even if it's a proportion or a relative frequency. But even when using the, quote, concept of probability, just keep in mind our true goal in context is information.